Ladies and gentlemen, I heard it was a roaring uh, night out at Angsiang Hill. Uh, those who are not present probably were there last night. Okay? Um, good, Bray, I think this morning we're going to talk about creative thinking, ideas to reality. And here I have a distinguished uh, panel. Uh, Lily needs no introduction to the startup community in Singapore. For our overseas uh, guests, um, <clears throat> Lily is the chairman of NUS, uh, sorry, the CEO of uh, NUS <laughs> she Enterprise. She promoted me. I promoted okay. her, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but she runs the NUS Overseas College Program for the last 10 years, and that has been instrumental in uh, creating many entrepreneurs and startups in Singapore. Uh, Kok Yam um, is uh, CEO of the Smart Nation Office Program. Uh, and uh, he is the deputy flag bearer, the minister being the chief de deputy flag bearer, that's going to galvanize everybody into this smart nation movement. You, you right? promoted me as well. Okay. I promoted you, there, okay. <laughs> Head, not CEO. I'm so sorry. Jason, I'm not going to promote you. You are senior vice president, um, airport Opera operations management at Changi Airport. All of you who have flown through, come to Singapore, you know how great the airport is. So at the heart of every successful business is a great idea. But mm. I've always wondered, and I'm sure you've always wondered as well, why um, we didn't think about them, right? If you had thought about these great business ideas, maybe we would have been billionaires. So um, how do we start? Um, these great ideas don't come on command. So what are the questions entrepreneurs should ask and how can we replicate some of this magic? So I'm going to start with Lily. You have been grooming <laughs> entrepreneurs for a long time, for the past decade. Um, maybe you can talk about some of the successes that have come out of, of the program and uh, are there any trends, uh, the similar characteristics you see among these uh, uh, companies and maybe these are the, the magic that we hope to replicate? Um, a lot of people often ask me, can you identify the top 10 that's coming out from NUS? And um, <clears throat> that's not my position. And my position is to ensure as many NUS students come up with new ideas, as many NUS students are excited about entrepreneurship. Um, that's, that's my job. So what do I see and how do we select uh, students to go on specific programs. Um, you know, Singapore students, if you have a typical questionnaire, they can answer it and it's an A++. We, my team actually does two to three interviews with the students and put them in um, uncomfortable positions, like there's a challenge problem within 15 minutes. Can five or six of you get together and give us uh, presentation. That is quite important because you suddenly throw them together, they've not met one another, and, um, and you see how they react in an environment like this. And at the end of the day, the passion comes out, um, their personality comes out, and that's how we select the students. Now, in terms of successful companies, um, I have to say that those that's been very successful in N that's come out from the NUS ecosystem, we didn't know. We didn't know if they were going to be successful. They came with a passion, um, a bit blur. If they're here, please forgive me, but you were blur in the beginning. <laughs> um, for our overseas uh, uh, colleagues, uh, blur means um, you're not quite sure what you're doing. Um, but the passion is there. And once you give them the support, um, they become and they became who they are. So that drive, that passion, willing to live through very difficult times, making a thousand, a thousand five hundred dollars a month or two thousand dollars a month as a fresh graduate compared to someone who's working at Changi Airport, maybe three, four thousand a month. Um, so that's, that's the drive and that's the passion. Yes. So can you tell us <clears throat> how these, these students get their ideas to form their startups? Oh, blur again because they pivot <laughs> over the course of time. Um, I, the, I'm not sure if the Zopin boys are here. I remember when they came to me, this is about seven, eight years ago, and told me, you know, when you go online shopping, you know, um, a little widget will come out, that's what we've done, and they ask you, can I help you? Then my immediate reaction, coming from the generation I come from, why do I bother? I just walk into any of the stores and I get 
you know, A++ type of uh, customer service. Why do I need to go to a computer and get someone to ask me what it is? It's irritating. So to be very fair, I don't know. Um, and I guess that's, that's just nurturing their risk. If you ask me what's the business plan and things, they will figure it out. But is it Honestly, a, they will figure it out. But is it a young person's game? You know, uh, being an entrepreneur, ah. does age matter? If you are a professor at the university, uh, I'm sorry, colleagues who are here in the audience. If you tell us that you want to do a startup company, you want to keep a full-time position at the university, you still want to teach, you still want to do the research, and you want to be the CEO of the startup company, I think that's really, really tough. So it's not a young people's game, it is a commitment. Okay. So that's, that's where it is. Right, so Kok Yam, so yes. we have heard so much about Smart Nation. Are there smarts that are living here that we are using today? Here? I, I, I think just as... Uh, I mean here as in Singapore or, you know, are there any smarts applications that we have that are now available today but people may not know of them yet? Well, okay, my first, my first response to your original question was that the, the smarts in this room, the smarts in Singapore are, must, be from the, must be the people that you're referring to ah, because okay. that's the, it's, it's the engine uh, creativity and ideas is, is the engine of innovators out there that will create a sustained uh, a level of our innovation throughout. Uh, whatever that is smart today will look a little bit dumb three years later. So it's always about sustainable uh, innovation, putting those enablers in place. Um, you asked about what, um, what are some of the things that we are doing. Uh, we've, we've, done a, we've done a few things uh, over the course of the, uh, of the past two years and, and I just want to highlight one or two of the smaller uh, less noticeable stuff, but it sort of illustrates the, the kind of uh, uh, value that can be created if we are able to put some of this um, smartness, as you call it, uh, in, into use. So the Land Transport Authority, for instance, after they've um, installed sensors on the buses, um, they, they've been able to use those information to, to, to good use to reduce uh, bus crowdedness uh, levels. Uh, to inject buses to at appropriate times to reduce waiting times. I think they tell me by six, six to six to eight minutes uh, on, on, on average. Uh, so they must have a metric to calculate that. But actually, the, the other story behind it is after they do that and they released it to the to the uh, to, to the public uh, as open data, the amount of downloads uh, that is done from third-party applications was about two orders, not two times, two orders of magnitude more than the downloads that's on uh, LTA's uh, own applications, which shows that once you provide that enabling base, once you, once you release something like uh, data and you allow others to innovate on it, there's so much more, that there's a multipli multiplication of, of effect. So may maybe that, that, that's, that's an example that I would like to cite and share. So there's a place for entrepreneurs in Absolutely. the smart nation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you want people to come and contribute, participate? Yes. Absolutely. I think in I think there are two ways to see this. Uh, um, uh, if you want to talk about government vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, entrepreneurship and, and innovation, uh, as, a, as, 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 as a government, um, we look at national systems, uh, we look at the transport, we look at housing, we look at health, and to be able to move the needle for the public, uh, we are looking at ideas that have potential to scale. For us, it has to be it has to be able to serve 1 million HDB flats um, potentially, and, and that, that's an idea. To scale. So we are looking for things with potential to scale. It may involve practically partnerships between um, startups and, and a, a larger company with the scale and the reach, at least initially. So, so that, that's what we're looking for. But also, we don't claim to know all the answers, nor do we claim to know all the questions. So our role as government, importantly, is also to create the enabling base, the, 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 the platform of enablers, or whatever you wish to call it, such as data, connectivity, and so on, to allow ideas that we haven't even thought about, questions we haven't even asked to be answered. And, and that, that has to be uh, a key role for, for government to play. Right. Um, Jason, um, yeah. now that they have talked about entrepreneurship and talked about smart nations, so you are the end user. You yeah. are the kind of uh, company that the government would like to partner with mm. for some of the smart nation activities. Maybe we can start by talking about uh, a couple of innovations, uh, innovative ideas that you have put in place at Changi Airport. 
It's something about the toilets there, you said? <laughs> <laughs> right, I think uh, for many years, uh, Changi Airport was always trying to uh, think of new ideas uh, to make the journey mm. for passengers more pleasant. And uh, if we look at whether it's the thematic gardens, trying to put a swimming pool on the deck, uh, on the rooftop, or you know, even to, uh, trying to uh, wow the passengers uh, with different events, such as the Star Wars Christmas celebration last year. Mm. I think um, yeah, the team thinking about all the experience creation at the airport uh, is uh, always looking for the next wow. But I think uh, if we distill all this uh, development down to its most basic element, I think it's all about putting the passengers at the heart of everything we do. Um, for example, you, uh, we, we say it's very difficult to uh, mention Changi Airport without talking about toilets. So I just want to show a hand. How many of you all have never used a Changi Airport toilet before? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's good that uh, you know, we see only one hand. <coughs> um, the reason why I uh, mentioned about uh, innovation and I use the toilet as an example, because it goes back to the basic of what mm. your customer needs the most. Innovation is not just about technology, uh, process design. It's also about understanding the human persona, what the individual is looking for. And it's very difficult if you look at um, being a passenger, going through you know, long distance traveling. Um, what do they need when they arrive at the airport? Or what would they do before they bought a plane? So I think uh, this is some basic thing that we start. Uh, say, you know, we start at 101, and you try to start to think through how do you wow people with the simplest idea? Sometimes, you know, big uh, outcome comes from a very simple idea. So when we mention about the toilet, I mean, I don't know, again, by the show of hands, how many of you actually have seen this uh, screen at the exit, right? I uh, see you have all these hands, great. And I don't know how many of you actually give us the feedback. Mm. But that mm. innovation um, about this, uh, what we call instant feedback system, is for you to tell us whether are you happy or are you dissatisfied uh, with the quality of the washroom that you have just used. Now, to many people, um, this is just a simple customer feedback system. But actually, the data at the back tells us whether we need to clean the toilet immediately. So if you think about service, which uh, just hypothetically, let's say we take an hour to routinely clean the washroom. But uh, someone you know, dirty the toilet 10 minutes after use, after the, the, the toilet has been cleaned, I have a 50 minutes exposure to the next unhappy customer. However, if someone come in and give us that, uh, uh, that indication that the, the toilet needs some uh, cleaning, and someone comes to attend to it in the next 15 minutes, per se, I will reduce the exposure to the next unhappy customer by half. Means that everything is done in the next 15 minutes. So, you know, you just expose yourself to the next unhappy, next unhappy customer for 15 minutes. So I think in the service industry, there's no, um, there's no, oh, I can do it later. Once you have an unhappy customer or dissatisfied customer, it's done. You can only do damage control, which is what we hope we never have to do at Changi. So that system, you know, as simple as it is, actually create this thing called cleaning on demand. So that's one on customer service. But the system itself also <coughs> tells us that actually you can deploy your cleaning resources at the places where you actually need them. Instead of the routine cleaning that people just go and check things and, uh, you know, the routine doesn't make it as efficient as well. And thirdly, actually that system helps us provide feedback to the cleaner on how well a job he or she is doing. And you give them the ownership of that cleaning. You know, cleaning sometimes to people is actually a very mundane process. Mm -hmm. How do you actually up the morale of your, of your colleagues who is doing all this cleaning and make them take ownership of that job? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you look at a, a, a simple uh, instant feedback system as such, but just three things that you can actually deliver to help change the entire mindset about how do we upkeep our toilets at the airport. So this is one example. So toilets, so you got this idea, yes. um, it's actually analytics at right. the end of the day, the, right? Yes. So how do you get these great ideas? Do you take your staff out on a great big track in uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, you go on a retreat, you know? How, yeah. how, how, do, you, how do you get these ideas? Right. I think, uh, if anyone in the audience here are in the service industry, um, you probably will know that it's very difficult to actually match or really quantify service. How do you price a good service? Well, in the restaurants, you probably say, yeah, I price by how much tips I actually give after the dinner. But in the service industry, sometimes you say, oh, this is a great experience. How much are you willing to go to the CFO and say, give me X millions of dollars and because I would like to invest in better service? 
And at the end of implementation, how do you actually come back to the board and say, well, I think uh, this is money well spent when you're all competing for a limited amount of resource. So every time, someone who is in this job will try to think, how do I measure? And then quantify it so that it can be translated to something that you can actually you know, go back and match to ensure ourselves that resources uh, is actually well spent or well deployed. So I think it's just from the basic of wanting to measure how well we're performing, firstly, you know, to the customer. The customer gives you the best feedback. And then secondly, with this data, then you can say, okay, where do I deploy my resource efficiently moving forward? Right, Lily? Um, Jason, can yeah. NUS put a pitch? We want to make the robots for you to <laughs> clean the toilets. <laughs> because <laughs> it's smart, right? <laughs> you, you don't need to, uh, you, you don't need to uh, mobilize uh, manpower. It's so more productive, yeah. right? So that's wonderful. I was just yeah. going to say that actually to have a robot to clean a toilet is not, a, not an easy feat. Yeah, it's not because, easy. Because uh, there are different toilets and and to have the intelligence to, to, to yeah. manipulate well, we, we yourself. We can think about it, so that so, yeah. becomes smarter. If, so if anyone can do yeah. that, it's wonderful. Because, uh, I don't because know, we'll put a pitch for it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so are you thinking about that now? Yes, in fact, uh, we have started to use uh, robots for cleaning at Changi Airport. Mm. Ah. Uh, we have this trial that's ongoing for the last couple of years. Uh, we have not brought the, toy, uh, the robots into the toilet yet. Because exactly as just going and says, it's not easy to clean the toilet. Yep. And I think the robots, you know, as, as intelligent as can be, Today, we just use them to um, do what we call the, the, the simple design job. Yep. And in fact, there's also this school of thought if we're really in the area of robotic. Today, I think um, to make such project or such trial successful, mm. we try to design simple tasks that the robot can do very well with very low probability of failure. Mm. And then slowly, as the robot gets used to the, get, gets used to the, uh, to the environment that it's operating in, then you start to add complexity or add intelligence. One example, even just a simple uh, trial on robotic cleaning at the airport, uh, it took us many months. And the reason is not because the robot is not doing a good job, it's not because the scrubber is not cleaning the floor to the cleanliness standards that we're looking for. It's all about matching the robot and the human resource you have in this cleaning process. Just an example, robots are great at doing open field or we call open space cleaning. But robots cannot clean corners. We say robot cuts corners because you know, the corners, they can't really reach. Right? So that's one, one, one key challenge we had. Secondly is, who is going to bring the robot to the place we're supposed to clean? Who is going to collect the robot back? I mean, some people say, oh, autonomous, they can do charging. But today, if we have not reached that level, because you know, let's say if you are using the airport as an example, um, there are steps, there's different level. How do you actually deploy these uh, robots? So actually, at the end of the day, you still need somebody to actually oversee these robotic uh, cleaning operations. So at the end of the day, one thing that we're trying very hard to do is, how do I match the right ratio of human and robots? Maybe one cleaner to three robots. So while the robot is cleaning the areas that it's able to do, the cleaner is doing all the different corners that the robot can. And at the end of the day, he will collect all these robots back to the base again. So this combination is something that we have been trialling and trying to get the optimal uh, ratio that then gives you the highest efficiency. So I think those are the things that you know, we're studying, and that's why when we say about robotic deployment, uh, it's not as straightforward. So I think, but that's a good thing. That shows that the humans still have a job. So you don't have to go for a walk. You just sit on a panel and you get some ideas to do <laughs> okay. for the next time around. Sure. Kokiam, so we talk about um, disruption technology must always be disruptive, but must ideas be disruptive to be creative? I, I think um, ideas should eventually be needle moving. Be sorry? Uh, be needle moving. It should, it should move the needle. And to, mm -hmm. to challenge ourselves mm -hmm. as a nation, as a society, we, we should... We should we, I mean, it's always important to work on the 1%, 2%. How do I uh, improve, uh, reduce travel time in peak congestion by 1%, 2%? How do I uh, allow for, um, for, for my healthcare system to improve by 1% or 2%? But if we want to uh, set effort, reserve resources, uh, put our minds to it, we do have to give ourselves more aspirational targets. Um, 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 uh, needle moving aspirations. We are not sure if we can reach it, but it is these, uh, it is these uh, needle movers that will that will really be the engine to 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 to, to motivate uh, innovations uh, around. Otherwise, if we go on the one percent, two percent track, it will go out, bring us down a certain path, and we've missed all these opportunities that could happen uh, three years, six years uh, down the road. The, the 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 discussion on robotics is a perfect example, 
Right. You need to do you need to do what you can do today with technology, uh, collecting data uh, from customers, and you need to go three years, six years down the road right. to talk about what happens if uh, if I can merge, if I can have robots collaborate with humans to do this job better. So so this is a uh, this is 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 very uh, uh, it's, it's a very enlightened approach that Chang has fact, taken. Just yeah. to add on to uh, the point, um, I think for every innovators, um, mm. it is it's important to know in depth about the innovation that, or the ideas that uh, we are pursuing. But it's also very important to also look at the larger ecosystem in which this idea or this innovation is going to be implemented. And i just give an example. We always talk about you know, uh, robotic uh, baggage handling system. Mm. Right, again, we have to use the airport as an example. Uh, today, we still have manpowers. I mean, everyone of us who flies, when the aircraft lands and come docking at the, uh, at the aero bridge, you will see our colleagues on the tarmac, on the ramp, waiting to do the baggage unloading. Mm. Innovation in this specific segment of responsibility cannot make a transformational change or a disruptive change until the day some innovation or design is made, or change of design is made to the baggage hole of the aircraft. Mm. So I think if we can innovate very deeply mm. in our own area of uh, interest or ideas, but if you forgot that how your idea or your innovation is going to connect to the larger ecosystem, yep. sometimes those are the things that is going to prevent it from widely uh, uh, implemented. So that, I think, is a very key uh, consideration when we talk about innovation. So Lily, so when you talk or when you guide your, your um, mentees, do you, do you ask them to think big all the time? Well, they have to, right? Because yeah. Singapore is so small. Yes. So any idea that comes up for discussion or they come and ask for monies, the first thing is, is it a scalable idea? I think, I think we have no choice. We are Singapore. We are who we are and what we are. Mm. And if we don't think um, of scalable ideas from day one, uh, you just can't grow the business. So most of them, I would say, majority of them will come in and say that. But I think another thing that comes up with students and, and, and folks on campus is we tend to be an ivory tower. They come in and they say they have this great idea because uh, they see that their sister needs it. So I'm like, how many sisters are there in the world that will need it? Right? So, so I think the ideas have to go beyond Singapore. Right. Singapore can be the base. The university is a fantastic test bed. I keep telling everybody, whatever, if you're developing an app, if you're developing an autonomous vehicle, like yesterday our person was challenged, right? Um, it's a perfect test bed, especially in Kent Ridge campus, because it's up and down. Mm. So autonomous vehicles need to go up and down and go into all the crooks and crannies. Um, so I'd like to see NUS campus as a test bed 35,000 students, 10,000 staff from uh, faculty to administrative staff. It's, a, it's, it's already a living community on, of its own. So, so ideas can be started there, tested there, but it needs to scale beyond um, the campus in Singapore. This is a question for all three of you, but maybe Lily, you can start first. Entrepreneurs are naturally creative. But how can, or you don't Thank agree, you. okay, you can, you can, you can uh, debunk that, but how can this DNA of being creative be further enhanced, distributed, or diffused through the organization? Okay, there are entrepreneurs, there are innovators. Um, overlap a little bit, but they're not, the two don't overlap 100%. So there will be innovators who may not be entrepreneurs. Mm. There are entrepreneurs who needs the innovation to take their, their businesses forward. So I think we, we need to se separate these terminologies. It's the same thing as productivity at the government when we talk about productivity. Productivity is not innovation. So, so all these words, we use it all the time, but we need to be very clear. And once we're very clear, we know what we need to do. Yeah. Okay, how do you diffuse this, this DNA, you know, this creativity DNA? Well, uh, well, I think there are two, two things. I think first is the, and, and we, we have to say this as a system, uh, first is the reward and recognition, uh, and, and, and not, not just by uh, the university, by society as a whole. So, you know, if I spent five years um, in, in uh, taking a bet on my idea and it didn't go so well, 
would an employer take that five years as valid working experience mm -hmm. and why not, you know? So this is something uh, in terms of reward and recognition that we need to be clear about. Of course, you, if you, if you, if you, if you take, take a bet and you lose money, that's a failure <laughs> in that sense. Of course, it's, 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 it's on you. But in terms of how the rest of society perceives it, I think that's important and your future employers. So that's, that's one. And the second part, and it goes back to my earlier point, really it is about if you come from the point that people do have ideas, they work on their jobs, they do have ideas, they want to, they, 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 they know what's, what's relevant to, to their line. And what you really want to do is to allow them uh, that access to resources, the access to data, the access to other people, the access to skills to be able to bring that idea to reality much faster. So you don't want an innovator in government, in, in your organization to spend half the time at meetings convincing 400 uh, 40 people from, you know, the, the assistant manager to the CEO, you yeah. want to give him the resources, you want to enable him to, to do that, uh, whether it's uh, data and so on and so forth. And those are the things that, as big organizations, we have to watch out for because we, 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 we are naturally uh, hierarchical. So this, this is something that's important within government for innovation. Go ahead. I mean, yeah, Jason? Well, I guess uh, for us, uh, we always ask the people, are you curious? Mm. I think curiosity is a very critical uh, attitude uh, in any individual if you want to talk about being innovative. Um, we hope that our people always think that good is not good enough and good is only a uh, transient state of existence. Uh, I mean, technology moves so quickly. There are always new things that's happening. Um, your customer demographics and profile will change. So whatever we feel that uh, we've done right, uh, at a certain point of time, uh, doesn't really guarantee you the future success. So the people must have this, uh, this idea that uh, we always have to try something different. And that's what we already encouraged uh, in, our, in, our, in our company uh, to get the next guy to come up with a mixed better idea and then support them in implementing some of that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Technology doesn't work quite right. So I'm going to look up here on the board and look at some of the questions from the floor. Um, let's take the one with the most votes. It's often said young Singaporeans are not hungry enough compared to young counterparts from the region. The risk-averse culture is a hindrance to creative and entrepreneurship. They want some of your thoughts. Kokiam, you want to take this? I, I think we... Um, <laughs> I will take um, it. I'm trying to figure out whether it's a good thing to be hungry or not because, uh, because uh, we, we've taken it for granted that uh, uh, yeah, you could make the converse argument that if there are resources, uh, we, ought to be, be, we ought to have the luxury to take even more, more, more risk. And I suppose the question is asking why, why is it not the case? Yeah. And I think it, to me, uh, it goes back again to how we perceive, uh, uh, how we perceive the entrepreneurship uh, career, the entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurship journey. Uh, if you have a university and academic system, and Lily, you can you can dispute this, where you know the 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 way to measure success is by the number of papers you publish, then you are not going to get entrepreneurs that many entrepreneurs, except for those, you, or rather you'll get entrepreneurs despite the system. But if you are able to measure success by other means, uh, then then you have a system that encourages that hunger because you have defined you have defined for, as a system, what, what success is, what food is. So I think that's very important. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not, I, I, I can't quite compare between the different levels of, uh, of hunger between uh, local Singaporeans and overseas, but I think it's, Im it's improving. I see a lot more exciting ideas, at least those that are touching uh, the government side of the house, uh, rather than the government. So I see, I see a lot yeah. more vibrancy uh, so, in the last few years. Really? Yeah. So the publication part only affects 2,000 of the NUS population. <laughs> <laughs> so we have at large, <laughs> a much larger population. Right. Can we educate the parents? Yes. Can we get the parents uh, more, yeah. less uh, in Singapore with this word kiasu mm. about their kids' grades? Let me give you an example. I was at a social event on campus and one of the parents, and, and this is a professional, came and told me that, oh, my son, daughter, I won't name names, got into your program. And he's flying off to the Silicon Valley. Um, I wanted to go with him to make sure that he's okay. I said, no, <laughs> I'm going to take your son out of the program. <laughs> it's, 
the whole idea of the program is to let them go on their own, let them find their own accommodation, let them buy the two thousand dollar car. How much money should I give my son to buy a car? I say absolutely nothing, <laughs> <laughs> if preferably. But can we educate the parents? I think that's going to make a big difference. Uh, how are we going to do that? Um, can we be less grade conscious? Okay. But the grades are also parents comparing amongst themselves, to be honest. It's not the kids mm. um, comparing amongst themselves. It's the parents, you know, my son, my daughter did this, my son, my daughter did that, right? Can we get away from that kind of a culture? Can we, can we look at it in a different way? I think yeah. that's a key problem in Singapore, right. I think. Actually, I, I don't think that the younger Singaporeans are not creative. Mm. Yeah. I think we are very creative. Um, and sometimes you think about it, creativity takes just one idea. It's not taking many. But I think the important thing is really the pers perseverance that's needed to see the idea through. So I think it's true that our environment offers our younger generation many choices. So if one takes the path of least resistance, where you try something, you don't see the immediate result, then we try something else. And I think for everyone here who is a successful entrepreneur, we know that you know, innovations and, 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 and being a successful entrepreneur, you know, that perseverance and hardship is actually a part and parcel of the journey. So I think here is how do we provide enough support. But I mean, individually, the, the, the younger Singaporeans must still say that I will, I will work very hard to make this idea successful. So I think that is the right kind of mindset. It's nothing about creativity or great ideas. I think younger Singaporeans today are exposed to many things. I think you're probably one of the most connected uh, uh, younger populations in the world. And this part about parents, I think it's also okay to be kiasu, but the kiasu, if you, if you, if you compare that to um, what uh, Andy Grove is being paranoid about who is coming up behind you, I think that is actually a necessary element in wanting to try to be the best. But try to be the best in taking an idea through to fruition, and that's just like comparing with people next to you. It's actually comparing with the larger ecosystem and making sure that the innovation that you have can take to the world stage. I think those are the right mindset, and, and I think that this is the kind of um, culture and path that we should help build, rather than questioning ourselves whether the basic uh, permit of whether uh, is the youngest Singaporean uh, creative, creative or not, I think that is a, is a given answer. Yeah. There was also another question I saw on um, um, how do we help startups pass the three-year mark? Right. Have we drunk the cool aid of Facebook and, and Uber and, you know, so how do we help them pass that three-year mark? Lily? So again, it's the question, right? How do we help them? Yeah. Rather than them coming up to us and say, I need to do this, um, I've done this. So I think, again, it's that, um, that, that thinking. But I think, um, on the other hand, we've seen so many coming up. Um, there's a lot of help in the Singapore ecosystem. Um, in fact, there's going to be even more help um, in the coming months. So I think, I think the help is not there. I think if your idea by three years isn't going to get you the number of customers you want, isn't going to get you the traction, then sit back a little bit, think about it. Why isn't it working? Find the advice, talk to people, and maybe just drop it entirely and close the company and restart again. Um, so. I think if at three years and you're struggling, ask yourself why. There's, there's plenty of help, I think, in the Singapore ecosystem today. Yeah, thanks. I think there are many questions on Smart Nation, so I think Kok Yam is going to be put on the spot here. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's go for Smart Nation is a great idea initiative to keep Singapore relevant. I think the idea is to create um, our own capabilities to keep Singapore relevant to have skin, skin in the game for the next 20 years. Mm. So what are some, how do you galvanize this movement? And what are some of the one or two outcomes like you would like to see? Mm. Well, I think uh, we, when, we, when we look at Smart Nation, it, we, you have to sort of look at it from the point of view of where, where our strengths are and what we actually need. So the, the need part is, is quite easy. Uh, in, in, the, in the sense that it is, it, is, it is quite clear, we have a lack of land, we have an aging population, uh, we, have, uh, we, we need to raise our productivity to, to continue to be uh, relevant uh, in, in the global economy. So these, these are innovations that allow us to 
use less land but have an efficient transport system. Innovations that allow us to um, provide quality health care uh, for an aging population without you know, having, having to have so many, so many uh, uh, health care workers uh, because there's a limit to that as well. And, and, and innovations that allow us to uh, make uh, fuller use of, of the, the fact that we have 80% of our population in public housing. These are areas where very clearly as, as a nation we need and we have strengths to implement because we are small as well. Uh, uh, transport, for example, because purely because of the fact that we are an island, we only have two land, two land links, we are a perfect test bed. Uh, the whole nation can be a test bed. Uh, so that, that, that's one example. Uh, the, the, the outcomes, I think, uh, as I was uh, sh kind of sharing with you recently, I think when you look at outcomes of smart nation, it cannot be divorced from what we want to do for, for transport, for housing, for healthcare in the first place. Mm -hmm. So from a, from a national perspective, it, the outcomes for transportation is about reducing peak congestion. That must be where my, the smartness and the technology is applied. If it's about increasing the modal share between public mm -hmm. and private transport, I mean, towards the public, uh, then it's about making public transport that much more efficient, that much more pervasive uh, to, uh, to allow me to achieve that. Um, but the, there is also another outcome, and it's hard to measure, but it's really about the time to reality, time taken to realize an idea. If I'm able to put out the enabling platforms, the data, and so on and so forth, uh, to have, if I have um, the resources, uh, things like Launchpad and all that, to allow somebody with an idea, the least time taken for it to take flight, uh, assuming it's a good idea, then that is, that is really uh, a, a sustainable kind of outcome that, that I personally do want to see in, in Smart Nation. Sure, thank you. There is also another question. I think this is a perennial question mm. about how the government takes, um, employs all the talent, leaving few to become uh, for the private sector and fewer even to become entrepreneurs. So, um, Jason, would you like to? As a government? <laughs> I'm not a government. So. Would you like to take off first and then maybe, you, you know? <laughs> <You're on. laughs> Say something. <laughs> But do you see that as when you employ your staff? Yeah. Are they the talent, the topmost talent mm -hmm. that you have? I think uh, it's, it's a choice of the young Singaporeans of what kind of career you want to pursue. It's not so much about you know, whether the government takes all the cream of the crop and then leave the private sector with you. I think uh, if the private sector itself also offer the kind of challenge and excitement, uh, plus a very clear uh, idea of uh, career development for an individual, they will have equal amount of uh, attractiveness you know, to bring the necessary talent. So I think uh, the landscape uh, is changing and evolving. And I, I think I go back to Lily's earlier point that parents are great influence of their kids in Singapore especially. And uh, in the past, they always look up to different role models of successful individuals. Mm. And whether you're a banker, are you a very successful person in the public sector, so and so forth. But maybe we have not uh, have enough of those people in the entrepreneurial landscape. So I think over time, this, uh, this uh, environment will change. And I think uh, our young Singaporeans who are so bright and, uh, and uh, fully aware of the environment will make the right choice. I, I'm going to uh, flank your question. Okay. And I'm going to say that maybe we shouldn't start from the point of view of where the talent is going because it leads down this, this path of having to define talent and then we yeah. inevitably end up with Lily's problem, which is the, oh, the talent is the first class, second upper from NUS, NTU and so <laughs> on. And that, that already constrains ourselves. We are five million to start with. So, so that already constrains ourselves. Mm. Today, you know, it is a perfect opportunity where somebody without a, a, a university degree can be an excellent programmer, can be an excellent software developer, can be an excellent designer. Uh, somebody uh, without that, uh, that, that five years experience in, in a company, who, 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 but who started uh, a, a journey of entrepreneurship, could have that experience, uh, a, a very relevant, very uh, uh, economically viable experience uh, going forward. And that, that has to be skills or talents in our view. Uh, uh, we have to have a broader definition than that. Uh, the second point is that it is not just about talent because increasingly, because, because it's, it's about even in corporations, it's, it's not just about the best programmer or the best administrator. It's about people coming together in a team, being able to internalize 
both the design, the business needs, and the, you know, the, the, the technology solutioning together. Uh, and, and to be able to be very nimble about doing that, that, that's going to add value, whether to government or otherwise. And it's about having those teams of talents, if you like, uh, uh, in, in, in your organization. So really a, a broader definition of talent, a more team-based kind of, uh, if that makes sense, uh, kind of approach to, to looking at human resources. Lily? No, I think the time's up. Since I'm co-chair of this conference, I just want to make sure everything goes on time. <laughs> <laughs> you all can talk to me after this. All right, well, thank you very much. I think we had a very interesting discussion mm. um, on creativity uh, from entrepreneurs, think big, from customer-centric to nation-centric. Um, and I thank you for your presence here today and for listening to us. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you.